Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing? It's good to see you. Hello, my name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor. I know we spoke already, but I didn't introduce myself. This is your first time joining with us. So if you've not been here in a long time, I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming to Cornerstone today. And I just want to let you know how important you are to God, that God understands what you're going through. He knows all the frustrations. He knows the triumphs. And sometimes you feel like no one understands you. And sometimes that's true. But God understands you. And the Bible says that Jesus faced everything we faced. He understands what it feels like to be betrayed. He understands what it feels like to be tired. He understands what you're going through. And so we have a high priest with someone who stands on behalf of us before God Almighty, who understands everything we're going through. I want to encourage you with that today. And so uh, thank you for being here today. And so we want to welcome everyone that's watching online and everyone here for the first time, nice and loud. Come on, we welcome everybody. A couple of things I wanted to, housekeeping things. Uh, first of all, our small groups are still, it's not too late to get involved with small groups. And after the service today, feel free to go out and you can QR code it and see what's going on. There's small groups. And if you don't have a small group, let me go ahead and, and suggest you go to one. It's called Freedom Group. And uh, I've been through it probably 10 times or more. And it's been a blessing every time I've gone through it because what it does is it teaches you how to go in the basement of your life and clean house with the Holy Spirit. And so kind of get rid of things and learn how to deal with things. And the truth of the matter is it's good to know how to get your spirit clean and pure and free. And every believer can go through that. So if you don't have a small group, tonight at 6 p.m., that's what's happening. Also, everybody, we are going to change service times coming uh, March the 19th. Sunday, the March 19th, we're going to change our service times to give a little more room in between services so you wouldn't have the problem with the parking. And also, I'm talking to the pastor as well that he would end on time. That helps too. So we're talking to him, and we're also changing the service times, and this is what we're going to do, okay? You guys are the lucky ones because you're not changing. But everyone else is changing. Aren't you happy about that? So the, yeah, go ahead, yeah. You guys are my favorite third service. You're my favorite third service. I'll let you know that. Uh, but we're going to have uh, 8.15 is our first service instead of 8.30. 8.15. And then the second one is going to be 9.45. And the last one will be... So you only have to remember two things. So on the 19th of March, we're going to have 8.15. Now, I say it out loud. 8.15, 9.45, and... One more time. A15, 9.45, and 11.30. Well, thank you so much. That's what's going to be happening, so we encourage you with that. Okay, so we are in a series called Habitat, Habits That Lead to a Habitat of Holiness, where you and I, we, we can do is set up habits in our life. Habits are blessings from God. There are things that you don't have to think about as much because it's like part of the operating system, if you will. It's like when you're driving someplace, you're driving to work, you can just go where you need to go. You don't have to think too much. Perhaps we should think more <laughs> when we drive, but you know what I'm saying. And so habits are wonderful strongholds. They can be strongholds of, of, of grace and health and strength, and it can also be strongholds of difficulty. So we've been talking about that week in, week out, and that often it's not always the goals that get us to where we need to go. Goals are important, but it's the systems we have that get us to the goals. And those systems would be disciplines or habits. And today I want to talk about the habit of giving. The habit of thanksgiving is something not just to happen during Turkey in November, but thanksgiving is a lifestyle that is a protection for your heart and will give you greater receptivity of what God is doing. Now, have you ever noticed that sometimes church can be a difficult place to be? I grew up in the church and literally had a, my little child seat. I don't know if they had child seats back in those days, but uh, whatever, a basket perhaps. Uh, I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor and I would see all kinds of fights in churches. In fact, there was a woman in my dad and mom's church that I was a part of, in the basement of the church, they were having a meeting about redecoration. If they should have a blue carpet or a red carpet, and one of the ladies slapped the other lady over the carpet color. I'm not making that up. It's stuff like that. How many have ever been involved with church wars? Yeah, it's not fun. And so, in fact, I grew up with that to the point where I got 
literally got sick to my stomach driving past the church. I'm like, I don't want any of that conflict. I don't like it until I read the Bible. And then I began to realize, wait a minute, there's conflict all through the Bible. And that's part of what God works through imperfect vessels. But what do we do about that? What about worship wars? Why is there so much strife in the church? In fact, there's a story, I, I, I hate to bring it up, I'm going to bring a story, uh, it happened, a very, very important story, that in a worship, someone killed someone over worship. Can you believe that? Actually took another person's life because of how they worshiped. How could that happen? How could someone kill someone because they don't like the way they're worshiping? That's exactly what happened. In fact, it happened not only to someone in a worship service, but it happened among brothers. And we can find that back in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4, the first murder upon the planet was over worship. Now, is it any, is it any wonder why the enemy would do everything? We have an enemy, by the way. Uh, it's, sometimes it's yourself. Sometimes it's the world system. But there is a spiritual realm that you may not be able to see that it's around. And there's an enemy out there called the devil and he has all sorts of angels that do his bidding, and they're out there to trip us up. But God is greater than the enemy. But he tries to use deception. And one of the things he will get us to do is, is to fight over stuff in the church, over worship. And you can see from the very first murder it was over worship. Isn't that interesting? Actually, it was. And so we're going to look at it right now. And then when we look at it, we're going to look at the antidote for that. And how you and I can have a habit of thanksgiving that brings us to real living. Now, here we go in, in Acts, um, Acts uh, Genesis chapter 4. We've been speaking about Genesis. In fact, almost all the, the word Genesis comes from the word genetic, where we get the word genetics from, which is a code, which is interesting enough, that Genesis is the DNA code of humanity, that you can pretty much find, quote, the genesis of all of our difficulties can be found in Genesis. In fact, Genesis talks about how the earth was created, how humanity was created, how the first family was created, how the first family had a murder. In the, it shows you the genetics, the components, the building blocks, and it gives us an antidote of how to heal it. Even Jesus is mentioned in Genesis about Christ who's going to come, which I don't have time to break it down today, but Genesis chapters 1 through 11 in particular show the whole formation of of humanity, and then later on it talks about our relationship with Christ. So let's look at this together, and you're going to see the genesis of conflict and how to bring healing to it, all right? Now, Adam knew Eve, okay, they had relations, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, the word Cain and the actual uh, the Hebrew word of Cain, actually, the, the, the formation of the word is take. Isn't that interesting? That Cain actually comes from the word take. And what a Cain, Cain's a kind of a taker. He's not a giver. Interesting enough. So this is what happened. We have Cain and said, I have required a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time a brother named Abel. Now that's a nice name to have, Abel. Who are you married to? I'm, mar I'm married to an able man. I'm praying my wife finds, my wife, my daughter, Finds an able man. I am an able man. <laughs> More than able because of Jesus. Okay. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. And, and, and now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Cain was a vegetarian. That's why we don't like him. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. He actually was a farmer and, and Abel took care of cattle. Now, just to kind of bring more context to what we're dealing with here is when Adam and Eve sinned, we, we talked about this. The first thing that happened, I just want to re reiterate what happened. The problem you and I have, I just want to just let you know, the problem you and I have is not all of our sins. That's a problem. The biggest problem you and I have is that you and I want to be God. We've been talking about that. And that Eve and Adam, when they decided to eat from the fruit of a knowledge of good and evil, basically they were saying, I'm God you're not God. I'm choosing to make my own decisions. I'm saying what's right, and I'm saying what's wrong, and I'm choosing. 
And every moment and every time you and I say, that's the, that's the original sin. So rather than try to get somebody to change all their behavior, which is exhausting and never ending, so much better if we get people's heart to be right and to make sure God is God and they're not. Remember, everybody, you're not designed to be God. The moment you become God is the moment you start dying. And every single day, here's God, here's me. God says, do this. I know God, but I want to do this. And so it's a little off. And so if, if I go on too long, I start going further and further from God. Now, all through the day, I'll be, I'll be transparent with you. I'm like this. I really am. I constantly have, to, oh, God, I'm sorry. Oh, but I, and then thank God people will remind me of things, right? And so it's my intention to make sure God's God. And it's a battle. I always, that's why the Bible says that we're to crucify the flesh daily, right? It's a constant battle, but I've made a decision to follow God. But the moment you say, I, don't, I know the Bible says this. I know God wants me to do this, but I don't care. I'm going to go my own way. And the longer that happens, the further you go from God. And you can choose to walk away from your relationship with Christ. Well, were you saved in the first place? I don't know, but do you really want to walk away from Christ? There's only one salvation and one name. It's Jesus Christ. And Jesus is God, and you're not. Until we understand that, we're going to hurt ourselves. Now, with that being said, with that being said, we have a situation here. We have Cain and Abel. I think we've established the fact that uh, Cain is the older brother. He gets more of the blessings because he's the firstborn, and Abel is the secondborn. Now, let's go and look at what happened next. And in the process of time, we're not quite sure how long it took, but there was a process of time. It came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. So he brought an offering of of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Now, if you remember what happened, if you don't, I'll tell you what happened. After Adam and Eve sinned, okay, there, God's a God of justice. There has to be payment for that. And so what basically happened one day is that Jesus took our place. And since God is a God that does not change and he's a God of justice, there has to be payment for the sin. And so Jesus paid the price for us. But until he came, there was a down payment, a promise, where they would use animal sacrifices to remind the people that, their, that sin will kill them. There would be, there'd be sacrifices. We don't do that anymore because Christ became the final sacrifice. I know it's confusing a little bit. I like to describe it to you more. But bottom line is God is a God of justice. There has to be payment. And God loves you and I so much that Jesus took our place. Are you, are you tracking with me? All right. So what happened was this. When Adam and Eve sinned, God came looking for them. They were running from God. And he had a redemption plan in place. And what he did is he, gave, he killed an animal. It had to be a sacrifice. And he put skins on them to cover their sinful way. Now, this is what happened. So... The sacrificial system was set up, and a lot of scholars believe that, and I believe that as well. And so what happened is, what there had to be is, you wanted to give God the first, your firstborn, right? You wanted to give God the best, and there had to be a sacrifice. And so this is what happened. So Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock. So he brought the firstborn. What did, what did Cain bring? Just an offering. It wasn't a blood sacrifice. It was just an offering. And I'm sure maybe Cain felt this way. Well, listen. Abel has a flock of animals. I don't have a flock. All I have is, this, is the farmland. So it's not fair that I have to give up one of my animals. He's got plenty. So I'm going to hold on to mine because I don't have enough. And, uh, and I'll give God this instead. And so when he didn't obey God, you see what happens. So Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And by the way, it's so interesting. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And so one of the things that God asked us to do in Exodus and Leviticus, he asked them to bring a fat portion of the offering. I know in ancient civilizations, blood sacrifice and animals was a part of the culture of almost every single culture in that day. I know we don't do that today. We just have hamburgers, praise the Lord. So, but anyhow, so what would happen is they would bring the animal sacrifice. And the point was interesting. God would tell them, I want you to give me the fat portions. 
In ancient civilizations, they thought the fat was the best part of the sacrifice. Can I hear bacon? <laughs> but we all know something now. We've learned that fat is not good for you. So isn't it interesting that God asked the Israelites to give up the fat portions of the offering and they could eat the other parts. Why? Because it was bad for them. That even in the sacrificial system, God does it for your own good. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's amazing. So this is why God did. And so this is before they knew about cholesterol. So Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portion. He did it right. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. His heart was right. What I mean by heart is his intentions, his thoughts, his desires. That's what we mean by heart. Okay, his thoughts, intentions, and heart was in the right place, and God gave offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. Why? He didn't do it the right way. His motivations were wrong, and apparently he didn't do it the right way. There was no shedding of blood. It wasn't the same thing. So he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. How come he's singing on the worship team? I've been here for 20 years, you know. How come this person is getting accolades? How come this person got a pay raise, and I didn't? And so it goes on and on. Comparison, how come this person's getting this? You see that, everybody? There's a jealousy going on. Why? Because there's two different hearts here. We have one heart that wants to worship God, that wants to bless God, and we have another heart that wants to take. And this is what we see happening. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. He began to sulk. Ooh, right? So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Why are you ticked off, and why are you being a little puss about it? Sour puss. <laughs> you said that correctly. <laughs> okay. If you do well, Will you not be accepted? That's what God's saying. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you've done what I've asked you to do, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door and his desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Basically, it's basically the same word as a praying lion like this or a house cat, okay? Sitting there waiting to the, the pounce, waiting for an opportunity. Say, listen, sin is right there. You know what I'm talking about, everybody. Right? We know that sin's there. He says, you must master it. That's why the Bible says no sin is overtaking you, but it's common to man. And God is faithful. We're not allowed to be tempted more than you're able. Able. But with every temptation will provide an avenue of escape. Here's the avenue of escape. God's telling him, here's your avenue. Take it. God himself speaks to Cain. And Cain's like, no, it's not fair. My brother. And what does he do? Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So what was the first murder over? It was over worship to God. What's worship? Thanksgiving and receiving the blessing from God. He was jealous of his brother, and it got into his system till he murdered. My friends, we're the same way today. How do we stop that murderous spirit? By the way, that's in all of us. If you don't think you have the capacity in you, you don't recognize without God, all of us are capable of every sin in the book. And if you don't think that's true, you're living in a mirage of a fantasy. If not for God, all of us would fall apart and become the most wicked people you would ever dare to believe. I'm telling you right now, it's the spirit of Christ that holds the universe together. It holds you and I together. It's God's grace. And so when we choose to say, uh-uh, I'm going this way like Cain did. So what does James say? Book of James, where do wars and fights come from? Among you. Do they not come from what? Your desires. I want what he has, right? For pleasure, that war within your members, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet 
and cannot obtain. You see, lust, the Greek word is like, I'm, I'm going to take, I'm going to extract everything I can. We're going to share about that a little bit more. But lusting is not a good thing because instead of trying to, to give something, you are sucking, you're taking. You're like, the, you're like basically like a, a big suction cup from hell, a big, like a vacuum cleaner from hell that the more you suck of the world, the more it sucks you out and the less satisfied you are. There's an old Chinese proverb a number of years ago talks about this. Talks about a vision of heaven and hell. Now, please understand, this is not accurate, but this principle is worth noting. And that in hell, in heaven, they, they heard this tremendous joy, and there was great food, and people were eating. And the person was far along. And then they heard crying and screaming, and they didn't know what was going on. So they went to hell, and they saw the scrumptious table full of food. But the problem was people had chopsticks as arms, and they were trying to feed themselves, and they couldn't. And so the food was there, and they could not feed themselves, and they were skeletons. They were dying. They were crying because they were trying to feed themselves. And then they go to heaven, and then in heaven they see people feeding each other with their chopstick arms, giving the blessing to somebody else. And as a result, they're happy. Now, that is an illustration. It's not a true statement. But the truth behind it is, if you try to extract, you will die. If you give, more will be added to you. And that's how it works. You see, your lust and do not have, you what? Murder. That's what Cain did, right? Because he's not giving thanksgiving. He's got a bad heart. You murder and you covet, I want more, and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Why is Putin in Ukraine? Because he wants more. Why do people fight here? They want more. I want my rights. She doesn't treat me with respect. He doesn't treat me with respect. I want my way. And the truth of the matter is well, that you and I struggle with this all the time, which I'll break down in a few moments. You fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. And check this out. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you what? May spend it on your pleasures the vacuum of hell will suck you dry and everyone else that's what lust promises you more and continually delivers less initially it gives you more and then it gives you less and less and less and this is what begins to happen you see thanksgiving to god is the key to everything why because it's thanks and it's giving which i'm going to share with you in a few moments the bible says this I want to know the will of God. Here it is, everybody. You want to know the will of God? Here it is. Rejoice always. How do you rejoice always? You see, when you recognize if you're in Christ, you know the best days are ahead, that one day we'll be with heaven. No matter how bad things are, it only gets better. That's why you can rejoice. For the joy of my salvation is my strength. Okay? So rejoice always. Pray without ceasing is having a God consciousness where you are talking to God. You recognize God's about and around you. You keep him in your mindset. You are praying all throughout the day, even if it's a sentence prayer or just being in his presence. You sense, like right now, I sense his presence in this place. So in everything... So rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything, give thanks. Not just when things are going well, but give thanks. Because it's going to be okay. God's in charge. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We are to give thanks. What did Cain do? He wasn't giving thanks. He was upset because he didn't get what he thought. There are two types of people in the world. Two types of believers, givers and takers. Givers are thanksgivers. And this is the deal. The problem is, if you, try to, if you have two people that are trying to take from each other, you become a leech. And so if I look to Sandra, and Sandra, you need to meet my needs, and she says, you need to meet my needs. You're not doing, you're not doing, and we keep, on, we keep on extracting from each other like two leeches, that the more we try to satisfy our own wants and desires, the more I'm drained, the more she's drained, and then that's it. It's not going to work because we're dying, because we're trying to extract from each other. I'm trying to get something out of her. She's trying to get something out of me. It may work for a little while, but it won't work long. But how much better is it if I... This is what happens, everybody. Imagine there's a vacuum tubes right here. And I have in, in connected to hell. 
central vac, <laughs> okay? I have the central vac of hell, and I'm trying to extract from her. And the more I try to get things out of her, the less I get and the less she gets until we deplete each other. But if I turn it around and plug those things into the, into the central vac of heaven, what happens now is I'm receiving from God and I'm giving to, out. I'm receiving of God and I'm giving. I'm thanks giving. Thank you, giving. Thank you, giving. So what happens is I'm taking the resources of heaven, I'm thanking God for it, and I'm giving more. And God's like, I can trust him more. And as a result of me giving to her and her and to me, now we both grow instead of deplete. That's God's system a whole lot better. Because what happens is I'm not working on my own power. I'm loving her as Christ loved the church. I wish I could say I do it perfectly. I don't. But you know what? I will say with all sincerity, my wife and I, we're like this. But we keep going back. She's committed to Jesus, and I'm committed to Jesus, and that's the only hope for our marriage. That's why we're growing in love. That's why I love her more now than I did the day I met her. And that's why I believe when I'm 80 years old, our Lord willing, and we're still married, I'm going to have a deeper love because I'm going to receive from God. I'm going to give. She's going to receive from God, and she's going to give. You see that, everybody? That's the way to live your life. That's the way God created us to be. So you have constant creativity, constant life. Life begetting life, begetting life, begetting life, begetting life. And the other way is extraction, extraction, and death. Extraction and death. You see it, everybody? So there are givers and takers. Now, let me explain. A giver's like a giver and a taker. That's mine. I mean, listen, right now, if we were to put a camera, which we do have, we had a camera in the nursery, and we put a microphone. I have a sneaky suspicion there's going to be some sort of toy that no one's paying any attention to. But some child is going to say, I want to touch that toy. As soon as that child, that toddler, touches that toy, every single toddler in that room wants that toy, and he or she's going to say, mine. Right? That's, that's what we hear. Mine. And, and, and that word mine is going to pierce your eardrum. And you're going to hear it if we were just quiet right now. I guarantee you hear, mine, mine, mine. And the truth of the matter is you and I have this desire of mine, mine, mine. And what we're doing, we're sucking up from hell. And we're sucking the life out of us and everyone else. Do you ever meet somebody that you have a conversation with and you think, I'm having a good day. And you talk to them and you, you walk out like, what happened? I got the entire, my life has been sucked out of me. I, I, uh, I, I just don't know what to do. Ever see uh, the theologian? Uh, there's a theologian out there called Pigpen from Peanuts. And he walks around with this dust cloud wherever he goes. There are people like that. They, they will suck you dry. And I've done it too. And I have to be careful because sometimes what happens, we're insecure. So I'll have a conversation, I'll have a conversation with, with, with Joe or a conversation with Steve. And I'll talk to them. And I'm like, well, I hope they like me. i got to impress them. i got to tell them how great I am. And so I'm talking about all these things. I'm worried about what they think about me. And so what I'm doing is I'm worried about them, not listening to them. I'm extracting uh, uh, approval from them. I want approval for them. And so I'm constantly trying to get approval. And as a result, they're like, man, this is draining me. How much better is it if I talk to Steve... And I just say, you know, when we ask Steve a few questions and listen to Steve, instead of trying to extract from him instead, listen to what he says and seek to understand instead of being understood. Sometimes my wife has to stop me. You keep interrupting people's sentences. I said, I know, honey, but I'm excited about the topic. She said, you can do that on Sunday. So thank you for the therapy session. I get to talk all I want. No, I'm just kidding. But, but seriously, it's very easy for us to extract. You see that, everybody. It doesn't work very well. So there's givers and takers. Now, you want to be able to give... And receive. Receive God's blessings in thanksgiving. Receive, give. Receive, give. That's why the Bible says we will lay down our crowns before his feet. Which simply means that all God's blessings, we say, God, we give it back to you. And what happens when you and I get into the mode of giving, it's like taking a light beam. Imagine a light beam from heaven comes down, a laser. You get, a, you get a mirror, you shine it back at God, it hits God, it hits back you, and it keeps going back and forth. And as it continues to go back and forth, the greater the light, the greater the heat, the greater the intensity, the more of heaven is in our life. You want to invite heaven in your life, give praise to God, and be a blessing to other people, and watch the environment of heaven begin to pour in your life and my life. This is what God would have for us. Now, how do you manage this giving heart? 
What I mean by heart, everybody, is your will, mind, and emotions. You follow me, everybody? All right, so a diabetic has a problem with blood sugar. And so a diabetic, what the diabetic has to do is they often have to prick their finger. Now they have these devices on their arm, which is a lot better. But right now you have to prick your finger and you have to test the blood and see the level of, of, of sugar in it. And you have to adjust your diet, therefore. You follow me? So you constantly have to test. Well, God has given us a test to test our heart and our blood. Is the blood through my veins Jesus' blood? Or is it a sick blood that wants more and gets less? And that's how we do it. I like a proverb said, the leech has two suckers. Look at your neighbor said, I'm not a sucker. This is leech has two suckers that cry out, more, more. There are th three things that are never satisfied. The fourth that are say enough, that we don't want to be suckers. We want to be givers, not suckers. Okay, in Romans, let me, let me just show you what this means. Let me just show you the toxicity of what it means when you and I don't give thanks. In the book of Romans, a lot of people like to quote chapter 1 because chapter 1 talks about a system of people who are turning away from God. It talks about, dis, it talks about rebellious teenagers, rebellious kids. It talks about all kinds of sexual impurity, impropriety, and all that kind of thing. It talks about all those things, and you're like, yeah, God, get them. And we're all excited about it because it talks about all those people. And then in chapter 2, it goes, but you are with that excuse because you know better. However, there is a progression that takes place in Romans chapter 1 that all of us in this room, myself included, are guilty of if we're not careful. And it's just like we talked earlier that all sin comes when you're not God, when you think you're God. Here's another one, okay? Listen to this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. There's a first problem. I'm God and you're not. You see that, everybody? Remember that? God's got to be God. Here's the second part. They did not honor God, him as God or give thanks. So now I am not giving thanks to God, to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. When you live without gratitude, your altitude will go into the pit. Because then you start complaining. It's not fair. It's not good. God's not fair. It's not good. And you become like Cain. You can become a murderer of God's promise in your life. Because you're never satisfied. Because instead of giving thanks to God, you begin to complain to God. Now, it's okay. In the book of Psalms, we can see that in the book of Psalms, there's songs written to God. And it talks about how horrible things are. God, I don't know what's going on. But then at the end, it says, but thanks be to God. He's my redeemer. It's okay to express yourself. It's, it's okay to lance the wound. Let the pus come out of your soul. But then put the ointment of truth on it that God is still in control. So we're not denying the pain. We're lancing the wound. We're letting the wound bleed out. And then we're applying grace and forgiveness to God and watch what God will do. So here we have the situation. Then an honor him God. Can you see that, everybody? So Thanksgiving is a heart test. How we give is a heart test. So how am I giving? And one of the greatest ways we do, the Bible says this in Proverbs, above all, guard your heart. Does not literally mean the organ of the heart, but in ancient civilizations, and especially the Hebrew culture, they believed that this, the epicenter of a person was their heart. Because let's be honest, you feel everything right here. So they thought, mind, your will, your emotions. All right? So, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. So, we're like a diabetic, we have this toxicity out there. And the way we keep ourselves right is by putting the right thanksgiving in our bloodstream. Thanking God for who he is. So that's why the Bible says this. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. So don't worry about just this life. You're building a sandcastle home that all it takes is a wind and the waves and it's gone. So don't store up for yourself here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in where? In heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy and the thieves do not break in and steal. Now listen to this. Watch this. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart, there the desires of your heart will also be. So if you want to change your heart, put your treasures where you want them to be. 
I want my treasures to be in the kingdom of heaven. So that's why I give. And we have some surplus from last year. We gave, we tithed already, but we're going to tithe another 10% off our surplus to help someone else's, someone else's church. Why? Because we want to freely we receive, freely we give. And I have never been able to outgive God. And I've never been able to outgive Sandra. If I treat Sandra well, I, I cannot, honey, I can't outgive you. Every time I try to overcompensate and bless her, she blesses me more back. And men, that's kind of how it is. That's why we need to bless our wives. So, treasure, therefore, desires of your heart will also be. Okay? Now, this is what it's all about. God cares about the heart. All right? Now, listen to this. When we talk about giving, giving is a great test. Listen to this. Each one must give as he or she has decided in what? His heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Listen, God is not impressed. If you give money and you tithe and you give and your heart's not in it, don't bother. Don't even bother. Because he'd rather have your heart than the blood of sacrifices. Okay? But it's okay to say, God, I know your word says, test me and trust me. So I'm going to give out of obedience to you, not because I'm trying to manipulate you. And what has happened is, unfortunately, some by ignorance and some by swindling have used the scriptures to extract money from people, and they basically sell you a, a, a program is give to God, and you'll get more back, <laughs> right? Give me $100, and you'll get 1000 back, and they'll show some woman on television or some guy that's on their last medication bottle, but they get the last $100 to the ministry, right? And the collector's going to come. They're going to repossess. But instead of repossessing, they're now living in a beautiful home with a beautiful car, and they talk about them on television. So your vow today, that is wicked. And the prosperity gospel in that capacity is a false doctrine run from that. It takes what God has said and twists it to actually make you become i'm gonna get out of god you've seen everybody i want to give to god because i'm gonna trust him so god's not impressed with offerings he wants your heart first but a good test for that is your treasures for where your treasure is there your heart is this is how this works all right so jesus says it very clearly he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other. That's why it says in the Bible, anyone that loves their father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. You must hate your mother, hate your father. Praise God, I can follow you, finally follow a scripture. No, 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 no. He's not saying that. He's saying, compared to Jesus, you must hate them. Showing the comparison. There could be no other but God. You follow me? So. No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or mammon, which some people think it was chomash. I'm not quite sure. Another God of wealth, mammon. So money promises only what God can provide. It promises a security. Right? Oh, I'm secure. I got my money. Jesus even talks about this guy. He says, I'm going to build a couple of barns. I'll say to myself, well, you've done well for yourself. And he says, you fool. Your soul will be required for you for night. Do you know that uh, for all our money we have, do you realize, I was reading an article that just really uh, encourages me, and I was talking to somebody this past week about it. Do you realize that if they dropped a nuclear bomb that has been fitted to be an EMP, electric magnetic pulse, and if they were to drop it uh, right above North, uh, North Dakota, 300 miles up, and detonated it with enough, with enough nuclear blast, it could disable all electronics throughout the United States, and you'd have no banking system, no power grid, nothing. Think about that. So everything we have, that's what those Chinese balloons are. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You see a Chinese balloon, you, you, you shoot it. Okay. <laughs> You're xenophobic. Oh, stop. Okay. So all kidding aside, in a moment, everything can change. So you have no security except for God. How about freedom? Well, I can choose to go where I want to. Yeah. What happens if you have a cardiac arrest? Drop dead. How about power? How about significance? So I'm, you see, that's what money 
promises you. It may give you that, but it's so fragile. But God gives us true security. God gives us true freedom. God gives us true power. And God gives us significance. And I don't want to be up here preaching so you'll like me so I can feel good about myself. Instead, I am approved by God. So now I can give to you what God has given me. And this is so much of a better place to be in relationships. Now, as we conclude, and the worship team makes their way up. If you start hearing keyboards all over the world, Jesus is coming back. <laughs> That's before the trumpet sounds. I've made that up. That's a joke. Okay. Pastor says, okay, honor the Lord with your what? Wealth. And with the what? First fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with Welch's grape juice for all you fundamentalists. Oh, with wine. Okay. Here's what Jesus says. Give, and you will receive. This is not just about money. This is about judgment. This is about benevolence, and this is about money. Give, and you will receive. Give. And say, give, and you'll take Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together, make room for more. Running over and pouring into your lap, the amount you give will return back. You show grace. God gives you grace. You show grace to somebody else. God will honor that. You see, the Bible says in Malachi, I am the Lord. I do not change. We believe the Old Testament is the Bible of the New Testament. If anyone tells you not to pay attention to the Old Testament, to unhitch it, don't listen to them. They're wrong. Because the Bible, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. He said, I do not think I came to destroy the law of the prophets, but I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He says, not one jot, not one punctuation will change. So the Old Testament principles are still there. It's always been about the heart. It will always be about the heart. That's what God cares about. Now, Malachi says this. Should people cheat God? You have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and the offerings due to me. There was a system that's been set up that we are to give tithes, 10%, and offerings to the Lord. Again, we're New Testament. If our heart's not right, don't bother, right? But... You have been cheated one of the tithes and offerings due to me. You're under a curse. What does under a curse mean? When God is not in your life, you're under a curse. Because the Spirit of Christ holds it all together. You say, Jesus, I don't want you. The very order that you're looking for begins to dissipate, and you open yourself up to all sorts of problems. So, you are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. It says, bring the tithe. The tithe is the Lord. As a matter of fact, New Testament giving, it's all God's. I don't own a thing. I don't own my life. I don't own my home. That's not my, that's the wife that I have, yes, but I'm a steward. This is not my church, thank God. This is the Lord's church. I'm a steward of it, right? So bring all the tithes into the what? Storehouse. Storehouse is the place where you worship. We believe it's here. If it's someplace else, that's fine. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple so God can work through his local church. If you do so, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out such a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it. Try it. Put me to the test. The only place in the Bible says to put God to the test is in the area of giving. But more, Jesus is not promising, the Bible's not promising wealth that you're going to walk around filthy rich and have gold toilets and, and Lear jets. He's not saying that. But he says, how many people know that true riches are not material positions? It's a position of the heart. Dave and Edith Young, dear people in this church, Dave is now home with the Lord. Not too far from here, because the spirit of the kingdom of heaven is not far from here. And he said something to me that branded my mind. I'll never forget it. He said at Christmas, and Christian, his grandson is here. At, at uh, Christmas, he looked across the table, and he said, I'm the richest man alive. He saw his family. He saw his wife. 
He saw his grandkids. He saw his friends. And he thanked God, I am rich. Riches are not what you own. It's what owns you that makes you rich. Who owns you? God or the mammon spirit? So, look what Jesus has to say about tithing, by the way. That's Old Testament. Well, look at this. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe 10%, even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. But you ignore the more important aspects of the law. They would say, give to the temple, but don't take care of your parents. He said, that's wrong. Okay, look what Jesus says. So he says, what's more important is having the right heart. But watch this. You should have, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, which would be justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Are we clear on that, everybody? So this is what God would have for us. And the Bible talks about this. Even Abram, Abram, I know we're going along. I just want to finish it up. Abram, who is the uh, father of our faith, if you will, he started the whole process. He brought to Melchizedek, who is a type of priest. Some people think he's an art, uh, a type of Christ. He actually said this, and blessed, this is Melchizedek talking to Abraham, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave, that's Abraham, gave a tithe of all to Melchizedek who was a priest of Midian, we, and the book of Hebrews talks about it. So tithing is something that's been practiced even before the law. We're not under law, we're under grace. But God's word works, and I want to encourage you to trust God, that without faith it's impossible to please him, for we must believe he exists, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Listen, everybody, I want to end with one verse here. Here's the Apostle Paul. I've learned a secret of facing plenty, and hunger and abundance, being poor, being rich. I can do all things through Christ or through him who strengthens me. The Lord is my portion. He will provide what you need. So as we look at becoming a habit of giving, a habit of thanksgiving that finds its way in our human relationships, it finds its ways in how we distribute what God has given us. Thanksgiving to God is the key to everything. Two types of people, givers and takers. Which one are you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today, and I thank you for your word, which is extremely clear, and, and Lord, I hope I was able to bring it forth in such a manner. Father, I pray right now that we be a free people. Father, we don't want to be Cain. We want to be Abel. Lord, we want to bring the first. We want to trust you. We want to give thanks to you. We want to, we want to make sure everything we have, we want to trust you with it and give it back to you. Father, we, we, we want to be givers and receivers. Lord, I pray this morning there be givers and receivers in marriages. Givers and receivers at the workplace. Instead of trying to extract what they can from the company, they would give into the company. Father, that we would, be, we would be givers in our country, that we would try to be a blessing and not extract. Father, in our relationships, and Father, yes, in the finances, a heart test. Father, we pray that we would give unto you and receive blessing back. Father, I pray that the poverty spirit would be broken in this place in Jesus' name. I pray, Father God, people will learn how to be free of poverty by having a thanksgiving spirit in which you can entrust us with more. In Jesus' name. Let me ask you a question. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you were to die today, do you absolutely positively know you'd be with God in heaven? You should know. If you don't know, you need to make sure you do. Because Jesus made us a promise. He told the man on the cross who gave his life to him at that very moment. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so... The only way you can be right with God is by sacrificing your life to him and saying, God, I give up. You're God and I'm not. You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. So that's what we need to do. You, are you willing to step down from being in charge of your life and giving your life to Christ? That's the first thing. Second thing, you need to believe that he is Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose again. And number three, ask him to forgive you of all your sins. 
and you can become born again. So I know better how to pray. Maybe some of you used to walk with God and you're not walking anymore. Maybe you've never completely laid down your life. Today is the day of salvation. I've been real with you today. Can you be real with me? Let's pray together. Anyone who say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time, or I've fallen away and I want to get right, nice and high. Anyone today would say that. We had several in the last service. Anyone here today? Okay, great. Let's pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to stay, to step down from being in charge of my life. I declare you are God and I am not. Forgive me now, I pray. Thank you that I am now your child. In Jesus' name, amen.